Howdy everybody, welcome back to Marketing. I'm Professor Martin. In our video right now, we're going to be taking a look at a few of the basic ideas behind brands and branding. Now, brands are everywhere. You can literally not go a few minutes at a time without having a brand in front of your eyeballs. In fact, you're probably wearing and you're probably covered in brands right now. I mean, just think about how you start the day. For me personally, I wake up in the morning, I go to the bathroom, get ready for my work day. And I've got my Gillette deodorant, and I've got my Crest toothpaste, and I've got my uh, Pantene shampoo. So right off the bat, second I open my eyes and get in the bathroom, I'm looking at brand. And I get ready for work, I come and, and I sit and do my videos, and then I get hungry, it's time to go get a snack out of the pantry. And I hit the pantry. And I'm looking at a, a pantry full of brands, right? I can grab some goldfish from Pepperidge Farm, some Fritos from Frito-Lay. I can grab a bowl of Cheerios. I can grab some uh, Del Monte fruit, Campbell's soup, Progresso soup. All the brands staring me right there in the face. And then I come back to work and make my videos. I'm doing it on a Dell computer, an HP computer with Asus monitors, my Logitech keyboard, speakers, mouse, and webcam, my uh, blue snowball microphone right there and so all day long i'm surrounded by these brands and they'll say i want to take a break from work i'm gonna play some video games that'll get me away from the brands right and so i fire up nba 2k24 before i can play any basketball though i've got to get my virtual basketball player some gatorade right because your virtual basketball player has to have gatorade to perform at his best and so i get him some gatorade and some protein bars and that way he'll level up and be good and then okay so now I'm done playing video games the families come home it's time to go out and have a fun evening out on the town so we hop in my truck which is a Toyota a Tacoma vehicle branded Toyota Tacoma and then we head to the ball game now surely at a baseball game I go see the Cincinnati Reds play I can get away from brands for a little bit right and so I take my seat at Great American Ballpark, and I'm there early, and I'm looking out at the field. How many brands am I looking at as I look at that field? Just take a second and make a guess. How many brands are we looking at here? And we'll go through and count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there are eleven brands right there along the left field wall. The foul poles are branded by Chick-fil-A, so that's 12 and 13. And then 14, 15, 16, 17. The team names are brands, 18, 19, 20, 21. We're up to 21. I'm not even done the other half of the field. 22, 23, Lori's Lean Beef there. 24, uh, Tundra sitting up on the Reds logo. 25, 26, 27. 28, 29, PNC's got three right there. I didn't even count the extra Toyota billboard in the middle. 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, the Budweiser sign. 38, there's another Bud sign. 39 for gravity. I don't even know what gravity is, uh, but that's 39. Bet MGM, 40. And then we got the team logos again. That's 42. And then Procter & Gamble, the iconic Cincinnati brand. Oh, they got their money's worth there. They've got 10 separate, <laughs> 10 separate brands that they're showing on their uh, scoreboard in right center there. So that's up over 50. You know, 50 and then up behind the mound, they'll have a little advertisement there. And then, as you know, you know, Cincinnati legend Pete Rose banned from baseball for life for gambling on the game. And now they literally put gambling advertisements on the field. What a world, right? And so you can see over 50 brands. And then the players come out and take the field. They've got Kroger brands on their jersey sleeve now. You watch an NBA game. The NBA players have brands on their jerseys as well. And we have one more, the Powerade cooler in the bag out there. So over 50 brands. Literally, there's nowhere you can really go without being inundated with brand. Even if you're just driving down the interstate, you see all the billboards. You can drive down around Back Avenue in Wilmington. You see all the signs for Taco Bell and Burger King and Wendy's and all that. So branding is everywhere. And what is a brand exactly? Let's go ahead and define it. A brand is a name, term, sign, symbol, design, or a combination of all of it 
that identifies the products of one firm while differentiating from competitors, right? And you think back and look at all those brands that we just saw. All those names and graphics and designs and logos all put together form their brand. And that helps me distinguish Toyota from maybe Ford, right? And it helps me distinguish the white socks from the reds if I want to buy a hoodie and all that. So we all know what brands are. One of the most iconic brands in the world, Nike and the Nike Swoosh. And you may have heard the story about the uh, graphic design student back in the 70s who created the Nike logo and they gave her like 35 bucks for her time. <laughs> and you think, what a great deal. And some people say, oh, she nearly got ripped off. But Nike also gave her 500 shares of stock which the lady never sold. And that grew and the stock split and the price of the stock went up and she became a millionaire from that. But 35 bucks, one of the most iconic graphic design logos of all time, the Nike swoosh right there. And we think about Nike and the power of that brand. It's worldwide. It's a global brand. You can find Nike in Latin American countries and Spanish speaking countries. You can find them in European countries. Uh, that's an ad from Germany. Helden is German for hero. Uh, you can find them in Asian-speaking countries. Uh, China, obviously, Japan, and also in India. I mean, you're talking about a global brand. All over the world, people wear Nike and recognize the Nike brand. And so one of the things I like to do when I'm out and about is I like to just see how many people are wearing Nike. You know, we'll go to Disney World. I think Disney World is a great place to kind of look at people's shoes because you're getting such a mix of people. People from all over the world travel to Disney World. And when I'm at Disney World, I like to look at people's feet. What are people wearing? Is Nike the have a monopoly on people's footwear, on people's feet? And what I'm finding when I go to Disney World, by, by the way, my wife hates it when I do this. She hates it when I take pictures of people's feet. And I'm walking around looking at people's feet. But I'm a sneaker guy. I got a bunch of Nike sneakers and uh, New Balance and different things. So I, I like to look and see what people are wearing. And if we look it's from the past July here uh, down in Disney World at Magic Kingdom, I'm not seeing a lot of Nikes. I see one pair of Nikes right there. And I see some different kind of hey dudes and sandals and all kinds of different brands. So obviously you go out and about. You can do this at King's Island. And you can do it at the Reds game or any kind of event you go to where there's a lot of people. Look at the feet. You'll find that Nike has a lot of competition out there. They definitely don't have a monopoly on footwear and apparel. And Nike for a long time has tried to make inroads with uh, women and trying to boost their uh, line of women's apparel and women's footwear. And there's a lot of competition in that space. You think about what you see people wear at the gym. You'll see a lot of Lululemon, Athleta, and the big competitors for Nike. And Nike's trying to get market share from those particular competitors. And you think about people who are maybe my age or a little bit older. They grew up wearing Nike. But they're not always wearing Nike now. They're wearing things like Skechers, Hey Dude, Crocs. You see a lot of that out there. And you think about people who are running and into training. You think, well, Nike surely has a monopoly on that, right? But no, you see a lot of people who are into running and fitness. They wear New Balance, Hoka, Brooks, a lot of different companies out there uh, taking market share from Nike. And so even an iconic worldwide brand like Nike faces a challenge. They have to manage their brand in a way that the brand can grow, but also change with the times and kind of change with the competition that's coming along. And you got a few examples of that. I'm going to look at Pepsi. Talk about changing with the times. Sometimes that means updating your logos and your brand marks to kind of refresh them, keep up with the times. And if we look, you can see uh, from the early days, I don't know what the heck Brad's drink is. I've never heard of that before in my life. But anyway, uh, from the early 1900s all the way through the early 1960s, Pepsi had a font based logo, which was pretty common of companies in that uh, particular era. And then we can see in the 50s and the 70s, it becomes more of a graphic kind of design. Uh, in fact, if you look, a lot of the, you look at a lot of the graphic design that was being done in the 50s through the early 60s, it's iconic. 
a lot of those designs are still being used today. And if they're not being used, people look back on those and, and kind of point to that as being uh, kind of the height of creativity and graphic design in some cases. But uh, you look and kind of see they've gotten away from the uh, more kind of graphic visuals to just kind of boxy things and then a more modern era, streamlined, uh, kind of italicized looking fonts and that kind of thing. And now we, Pepsi just actually had a refresh of their brand. Yeah, new logo there that they've come out with that kind of harkens back to the late 60s, early 70s. And I think you're going to see a lot of that in branding. I think you're going to see a lot of companies kind of dip the more modern looking brands to go for a more classic throwback looking design. And so kind of keep an eye out for that. Nike, obviously, the, the uh, swoosh has stayed the same since the 1970s. They may never refresh, but a lot of companies will go through and refresh their design and their brand marks every so often to keep them current with the times. They'll also update their promotional messages to reflect kind of the times. You look at Pepsi. Pepsi's always used a lot of uh, musicians in their advertising. Uh, musicians that really catered to younger generations or appealed to younger generations you know so in the 80s that was michael jackson and nobody was bigger than michael jackson in the early 2000s it was britney spears and they, they continued that trend today with doja cat and so trying to kind of have people that are the face of the brand who are popular at the time and reflect the times that are going on is very important also adapting product offerings to taste as they change right now uh, there's a little bit of a sentiment among the public that maybe drinking a whole lot of soda isn't good for you uh, especially all the sugar involved and so pepsi you know they're trying to keep up with that trend with their zero calorie offering zero sugar and uh, the new improved taste trying to sell that product to people who are like ah, i don't like diet sodas they don't taste good they're also trying to keep up with other trends like the uh, idea of craft sodas Obviously, craft beer has been a big thing for a long time, and now they're trying to bring that idea to soda. And they have a draft nitro-infused cola, uh, which to me, I've tried it, it tastes like flat Pepsi. I didn't really understand what was going on with that one. I'm not a big Pepsi guy anyhow, but I definitely didn't like that particular product. But that's Pepsi trying to keep up with changing taste. So that's challenging. You got to keep up with the times. You got to refresh the brand every now and then to stay relevant and all that good stuff. That's all part of managing the brand to try to get brand loyalty. That's the goal of our brands. We're trying to achieve brand loyalty. Brand loyalty is the degree to which a consumer is familiar with and will accept or purchase the brand. How loyal are your consumers to the brand? And we have three stages of brand loyalty that you need to know about. There's brand recognition. And so a brand new brand may be unknown. People have no idea what it is. It's an unknown quantity, an unknown factor. But maybe with a little bit of advertising, maybe getting on store shelves, maybe a customer uh, starts to see that brand and then they achieve brand recognition. I know what that brand is. I see the logo, I understand what it is, I'm familiar with it, I know, uh, you know, have some kind of perception as to that brand. That's the brand recognition stage. That's the first stage that a brand has to go through. You got to go through brand recognition. People have to recognize the brand. The second stage is brand preference. After consumers recognize the brand, they try it, they like it, they begin to prefer that brand, meaning they will choose that brand over other brands most of the time. Okay, so a brand preference, it doesn't mean that I, I will pick that brand every single time I go out and shop and I will look for it and I will buy it no matter what. Brand preference is, hey, I prefer Coke to Pepsi. But if I go to a restaurant and they have Pepsi, I'll drink a Pepsi. Or if Pepsi's on sale, I'll buy Pepsi instead. All right, so brand preference is, and eh, I prefer it, but I'm not going to buy it um, regardless of any other factors that's out there. That comes at brand insistence. Brand insistence is where the brand has a monopoly on your purchases. I will not buy anything but Coke. All right. If I go to a restaurant and they serve Pepsi, I will say, no, give me a water. 
I insist on Coke. If I go to buy a vehicle, I insist on Ford. I will not buy any other vehicle. And that's brand insistence. The brand has a monopoly on your purchasing dollar. All right? A brand has to go through every one of those stages. And sometimes they don't make it to brand preference or brand insistence. Sometimes they don't even make it to brand recognition. <laughs> All right? But you can't get to brand insistence unless you've gone through brand recognition and brand preference. It's kind of a, a one, two, three process here. And so think about your brand loyalty. I'm going to give you a couple of brands here. And I just want you to think about your loyalty level to that particular brand. Recognition, preference, insistence. So what's your level of brand loyalty to Tide? Tide detergent. Do you have a, a level of loyalty to that? You have three different items on the scale there. Do you recognize Tide? Do you prefer it? Or do you insist upon it? What about Chipotle? Chipotle Mexican Girl. What's your level of brand loyalty to Chipotle? And then finally, American Eagle. What's your level of brand loyalty to American Eagle? If I'm looking at it personally, in our family, we insist upon Tide. We have brand insistence for Tide. Why is that? I'm not really sure. It's just something that uh, I, I grew up, my parents bought Tide, and that's kind of just what we've always bought. And we don't comparison shop. Other brands might be cheaper. Other brands might go on sale. We may have a coupon for some other brand. Doesn't matter. We always buy Tide. You don't even think about it. Chipotle is probably brand preference. And when we go out to get uh, fast food or fast casual, we don't always get Chipotle. But, you know, if we're looking at uh, Mexican food and looking at fast casual, that's probably the brand that we would prefer. And then American Eagle is bit, it's probably a brand recognition scenario for me. I'm, a, I'm in my 40s now, and a 40-year-old dude can't be fooling around with a, a, a clothing company that is kind of targeted toward teenagers, right? I would look completely out of place if I started wearing a bunch of American Eagle stuff. So I, I, I understand what the brand is. I have knowledge of it. I, you know, I probably had some American Eagle stuff 10, 15, 20 years ago. But right now, in my current state as a consumer, it's more of a brand recognition than any kind of uh, preference or insistence. Obviously, there's a lot of benefits to having a strong brand. In the automotive world, Toyota has one of the strongest, most reputable brands in the business. Some of the benefits of having that strong brand. First of all, it increases the likelihood a consumer is going to recognize your product. Toyota can roll out a brand new line of vehicles. And I may not be familiar with the uh, model name, but as long as it has that Toyota brand on it, I can recognize it. And then the second point there, jumping off from that, is not only will I recognize the product offering, I'll also have some kind of preconceived notion as to what to expect out of that from a quality standpoint. Because it carries that Toyota brand, it will contribute to my perception of how good that vehicle is. Or if you're not a Toyota person, you think Toyota's junk, you'll think, well, that car's junk too, right? But we're talking about the value of the brand here, so we'll keep it positive. It reinforces customer loyalty and repeat purchases. Personally, when we got out of college, my wife and I, we started buying Hondas. We had a bad experience with the first two Hondas we bought, a Honda Civic and a CRV. The Honda Civic left us stranded on the side of the road with a dead transmission at about 130,000 miles right after the warranty expired. Honda did nothing to help us out. Had a CRV that we bought a few years later that started having transmission problems. Dealers couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. Uh, first of all, when we first took it to them, they ran the diagnostic and said something was wrong, and then they changed routine and said, no, nah, nothing's wrong. When you would drive it, it would shudder. When it would go from third, fourth, fourth to fifth gear, it would literally shake. All right? It was pretty obvious there was something wrong with the transmission. And so we eventually just ended up trading it in. And I've not bought another Honda since. We bought five Toyotas. And every one of those Toyotas, I'm going to take it back, we bought four Toyotas. One of them was uh, uh, had an accident. Wife ran into somebody. Had to get totaled it. And so we replaced it with a, another Toyota. But the, the Toyotas never had a problem with at all. And they've been great vehicles. So we come up to buy our next car when the kiddo 
gets the second hand hand me down, we got to go buy a new vehicle, probably buy a Toyota. Repeat purchases, customer loyalty. And that leads to brand equity. The added value of brand gives to the product in the marketplace. And so your vehicle, it's not just a pile of steel and parts and plastic and tires. Uh, that's not just the value proposition that you're getting. You're also getting something on top of that from the brand, the added value that all that brand equity brings to the table. So let's ask you uh, one more time here. Think about brand equity. Again, brand equity, the added value a brand gives to the product. What brands do you feel enjoy a high level of brand equity? And think about that for a second. You can jot it down and think about it. Heck, even email me. Professor Martin, I think that blah, blah, blah has a high degree of brand equity. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, personally, I think about one particular company that has a very high level of brand equity. I can't help but think of Apple. How many people go to buy every iteration of the iPhone? You talk about uh, reinforcing customer loyalty and repeat purchases leading to brand equity. Man, there's probably people that have bought <laughs> eight different Apple iPhones over the past 15 years or so. And that's some serious brand equity. Now, they don't even think of buying any other phone. Moreover, when they buy other peripheral products like uh, earbuds and things like that, or maybe a tablet or a watch, they're buying Apple, staying in that ecosystem. Very, very high levels of brand equity. And that's why Apple products are so expensive. Because they can be. They have pricing power. They know they don't have to uh, sell an iPhone for 200 bucks to get people to buy it. They can sell it for 800 People still buy it. Why would they sell it for 200 They don't need to. <laughs> All right, so that's a little bit about brands. I thought what I'd do here at the end is I, I kind of wanted to show you a job posting for a brand manager. We talk a lot about the concepts in marketing, but sometimes we don't always show, hey, you can actually get a job in this stuff. And a branding to me is fascinating. It's something we see in everyday life. And uh, to me, it would be a pretty neat field to work in, especially if you like marketing and you like creativity and you like strategy and all that stuff. So Procter & Gamble, again, Cincinnati company here. This is a job posting that is actually available in Cincinnati. They are looking for a brand manager. Now, obviously, Procter & Gamble has a ton of brands, everything from Head & Shoulders, Gillette Razors, uh, Swiffer, house care, uh, home care products, uh, Pampers diapers and Crest toothpaste. I mean, yeah, a ton. You can go to the website and see all their brands. The particular posting doesn't say what brand it is for, but it's the posting here is for a brand manager. Again, one of the locations is Cincinnati entry level. And you can see the starting pay, 85,000 to 115,000 a year. Now this would be a four year degree job, uh, but that's a, a pretty good <laughs> Uh, salary right there. How about the job description? Are you looking for meaningful work? Come to PNG or PNG, Procter and Gamble. Uh, did you know Procter and Gamble invented the concept of branding over the years? We remain consistently among the top in marketing by finding new and exciting ways to reach customers. As a brand manager, you will be responsible for making sure we win with consumers' preferences in each of the following areas when they learn about the product. Think back to our three stages that we talked about, brand recognition. So you're controlling what happens when the customer learns about the product, that brand recognition period. When they choose to buy the product, brand preference, brand insistence. And then finally, when they use the product at home. And some of these big marketing companies or big companies like Procter & Gamble, they'll send people into customers' homes and watch them use the product. In fact, it's a fascinating story. You've probably, and it's an Procter & Gamble story, this is a ketchup story, Heinz ketchup. You've probably at the dinner table used Heinz squeeze bottle ketchup, right? You think, well, how in the world did they come up with the idea for squeeze bottle ketchup? It came from a visit to a customer's home that Heinz conducted. And a marketing person from Heinz went into a customer's home was watching them have dinner and uh, they had a little kid at the table and the little kid asked for ketchup so the mom took the glass bottle of ketchup which the kid can't handle you know you got to take the glass bottle and shake it and pound it the kid can't do that so the mom 
took the glass bottle, took the knife, if you ever use your glass bottle, and scraped out a little ketchup, and then kind of took it away. And the marketer saw the kid's reaction to that little doubt of ketchup and said, huh, the kid can't control the portion size. The kid can't really handle the product. It didn't seem like a very satisfying experience for the kid. So the marketer took that information back and they kind of decided we need to find packaging that a kid can handle. Right? So now what happens when the kid has dinner? I want some ketchup. The kid is handed the ketchup and if the kid's anything like my kid, the kid will turn the ketchup bottle over and <laughs> until like there's literally an, a sea of ketchup on the plate. Good business for Heinz. Now they've got all this wasted ketchup and the family has to buy ketchup every week at the grocery store, right? So uh, that's part of that when they use the product at home, getting that kind of information and being able to use it. Just kind of fascinating stuff right there. So if you're into marketing and you're into... Uh, the idea of managing brands. There are opportunities in your backyard where you can do that. And you just kind of have to go get your four-year degree in marketing and go kick your kick down the door and get on a Procter & Gamble or any other uh, big company that does a lot of uh, national marketing like that. Questions, comments, anything that is on your mind, I'd be happy to hear from you. Feel free to drop me a line anytime. If you want to talk about branding, as I mentioned, it's kind of a a fun subject and something I like to think about. I like to look at brands and look at the logos and look at the strategies involved and all that. And if you got any fun stories or insightful stories to share, I'd love to hear them. Send them my way. We have one more video that we're going to go through. We'll talk about uh, new product development and some of what goes into that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you back here for that. Until then, take care, everybody.